News of the Times. Serial Killer Saturdays. Amelia Annie Dyer. The Ogress of Reading. Welcome to News of the Times. Although News of the Times delights in finding riveting, lesser-known stories, yet we feel we would be remiss if we did not tackle some of the more famous ones too. Arguably, even over Mary Ann Cotton, the case of Amelia Annie Dyer from 1896 may win the distinction for her being the very worst of all serial killers. Her victims have been estimated as potentially reaching between 300 and 400 lives. Her target? Babies and infants. The reason? Financial gain. We would like to warn our listeners that some may find this story particularly upsetting. We look at the person and the crimes in today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. We hope you enjoy the show. The Crime On the 30th of March 1896, a bargeman discovered a package in the Thames at Reading. Opening it, he was horrified to discover the body of an infant girl. Whatever weight had been attached to the package had slipped, and the package was easily seen bobbing upon the water. The bargeman took the package to the police. There, with close inspection, was faintly discerned the name of Mrs. Thomas, an address and a ticket referring to Temple Meads train station in Bristol. Little did they know that this would be the start of the unveiling of a ruthless series of slayings of the most vulnerable in society. From the Southern Echo, the 13th of April, 1896. The First Clue The parcel containing the body found on March the 30th, which gave the first clue, proved valuable evidence in more ways than one. The address on the paper. The parcel had not been in the water very long, presumably two days, when it was found by the waterman. And as the body was decomposed, this raised a suspicion in the minds of the police. Bristol police were contacted. The Thames police travelled up to the area and it was agreed to keep the house under surveillance. Using a female decoy to act as a woman who wished her baby to be cared for, Dyer's advert in the paper was answered. The ploy worked, and Dyer, under the name of Mrs. Thomas, did indeed offer to take in the infant. Police arrived and entered the property of Mrs. Thomas, stroke Mrs. Dyer. Here they found a wealth of incriminating evidence. Tape, similar in nature to that which had been used to strangle the infant. Macrame, similar to that which was used to tie the parcel of the body of the child. Pawn shop stubs for articles. Old train ticket stubs and the distinct smell of death. Although... No dead bodies were found on the premises. Annie Dyer, alias Thomas, was arrested. From the Sheffield Evening Telegraph, the 4th of April, 1896, Tracing a Dead Child, Accusations Against a Nurse At Reading today, Annie Dyer, alias Thomas, an elderly woman said to be a nurse, was remanded, charged with having murdered a female child, name unknown, whose body was discovered in a parcel recovered from the Thames on Monday last. Superintendent Tuesley said that they had evidence to prove that the accused left home 
with the parcel on the day named, and that tape with which the child had been strangled corresponded with that found at her home. The accused pleaded not guilty and said she knew nothing about the matter. Some historical background information. Baby farming, a term used to describe the practice of fostering or adopting unwanted infants for a fee, became alarmingly prevalent in Victorian times. What was once considered aimed at providing care for abandoned or orphaned children often devolved into a lucrative enterprise. The rise of baby farming could be attributed in part to the societal pressure and constraints faced by women in Victorian England. The strict social norms and limited access to contraception and options for unwed mothers created an environment ripe for exploitation. Desperate women, burdened with shame, financial limitations, and ostracized by society, turned to these so-called caregivers offering a better life for the child in a desperate bid to find a solution to the limitations of the time. Within the circle of baby farmers, many of these defenseless children fell victim to neglect, malnourishment, and even deliberate harm as profit took precedence. Amelia Dyer, known as Annie Dyer, made it her career to take children, collect the money for the child, and then kill the children. The children ranged in age between infants to small children. Dyer's business model. Adverts went out to all the papers along the lines of her wishing to adopt a child to care for as she and her husband were childless, luring desperate mothers with promises of a brighter future for their children. She would charge a fee for her service. Dyer used a range of false aliases. Once interest was shown by a mother, Dyer began a correspondence with the mother. There are several examples of her letters, all glowingly supportive, all promising an idyllic new life for their child. All the letters expressed a deep love for children and a desperate wish to have one of her own to care for. Women in such a compromised position would find it difficult to refuse the offer of such a bright, comfortable future for the child. Once the mother was convinced that her child would indeed be adopted by a set of loving parents, a time would be set for the handover of the child with a one-off payment, normally around £10 by the mother to Dyer. The sum is equivalent to approximately £1,700 in 2023. Dyer would promise to send regular letters to the mother, keeping the mother updated on the welfare of the child that had been given up. Once the child had been handed over, the child rarely lasted 24 hours before being strangled, sometimes with her own hands, something with tape wrapped round the neck. Dyer also admitted to suffocating children. Dyer stated that she'd like to watch the child die. From here she would package up the infant body and throw the package into the water, usually weighed down with a brick. As the mother would have the address from the correspondence with Dyer under her assumed alias at the time, Dyer often moved to a new environment with a new alias. To give a complete picture of just how active she was, we have included this article tracing her movements. In all of these locations, she was thought to have run 
the same baby farming enterprise. It is for this reason that we can only guess as to the number of deaths we can decisively lay at her door. From the Illustrated Police News, 25th of April, 1896, The Reading Horror, particular of Mrs. Dyer's career. The almost complete life history of the woman has been traced by Chief Constable Chewsley. She is a native of Bristol, and her father and relatives are well-to-do tradespeople in that city. She was brought up and trained as a hospital nurse in the Bristol Infirmary 27 years ago. She was married to William Dyer, who is at present engaged at a vinegar factory there. In 1880, she was tried at the Long Arton Police Court, Somersetshire, and was sentenced to six months hard labour for baby farming at Totterdown. Note to our readers, Dyer was known to have referred to this time in prison as brutal and almost as an excuse for her actions later. It is important to note that she had been sent to prison for horrendous treatment of a child. In 1887, she was living with her husband at Fish Ponds in Bristol, where she is supposed to have taken in children. Her husband left her about three years ago, but for what reason that has not been made public, but he undoubtedly knew that she was in the habit of adopting children. For about 16 years ago, while living at Totterdown, she kept a baby farm. She generally went under the name of Dyer, but about 12 months ago, when at Fishponds, she adopted the alias of Smith. Subsequently, when she was at Hawfield, she advertised in the name of Wathron. Her trade in children seems to have been extensive, and naturally, in some cases, inquiries were made after the children, but when the woman could give no satisfactory account of their whereabouts, it is said she would sham madness and attempt suicide and go into an asylum for a short time till the matter blew over. The first occasion when this was done was in 1891. Being unable to give satisfactory answers to the inquiries with reference to a certain child, she tried to cut her throat with a knife, but she evidently had no intention to do away with herself, for there was a mere scratch on her throat. From 1891 to 1894, she was several times in the Gloucester Asylum. In February 1894, she met when at Barton Regis Workhouse, an old woman, also an inmate, called Granny, with whom she subsequently visited in Cardiff. On leaving the Union early last year, Mrs. Dyer went to Fishponds, where she had a baby farm, and hither went Granny with her. Their stay there, however, was short, for on July the 13th, Mrs. Dyer and Granny came to Cardiff. One of the children named Bertie Palmer, which Mrs. Dyer had sent to her at Bristol, was found abandoned in Eastville Park in Bristol. The child was taken to the Union. Another child she had with her at Bristol was brought to Cardiff and has not been traced. Twelve months ago, April 1895, she was living at Eastville under the name of Smith, where she took ladies in to nurse during confinement and kept the children for a consideration. From Eastville she moved to Fishponds and thence to Ashley Hill. After a time she turned up at 
horse field where she advertised for children to nurse and got into trouble over a baby she had received but which could not be afterwards found. She went next to Ashley where she passed as Mrs. Wathram, still taking children in to nurse. Fish Ponds was the place of her abode and following that, Shannon's Hill. Thence to Eastville Park and the other she took to Cardiff. From South Wales she was traced to Notting Hill and from there to Caversham and Reading. As Dyer was remanded in prison, investigations continued and evidence was collected. Simultaneously, different locations from where she had lived were investigated for bodies. From the Southern Echo, the 13th of April, 1896, Mrs. Dyer's past. Chief Constable Tewsley, to whom all credit is due for his energy in this case, is hourly learning more and more regarding Mrs. Dyer's past. She came from Bristol to Caversham. In the former city she took in children, and at that present moment there was a child in the Bristol workhouse which the woman stated to have left behind when she departed from the town. The details of her conviction in the county of Somerset for keeping a baby farm are also in the hands of the police and will be used against her at the trial. The letters found at the woman's house in Kensington Road are very numerous and tell some sad tales. From these it would appear that she refused to take children upon the weekly payment system. She demanded a cash payment. Mrs. Butcher, who lives in the district of Reading, states that she endeavoured to persuade Mrs. Dyer to take her child on the weekly principal. This was refused, and on February the 11th, the infant and a sum of money were handed over to the now imprisoned woman. Mrs. Butcher's baby is alive, and Willie Thornton, aged nine years, are still at Mrs. Dyer's house. The police believed these two infants were used by the woman as decoys. In fact, some of the letters of recent date state how pleased the writers were to find the two children looking well, and they were sure Mrs. Dyer would be as good mother to the baby they proposed sending to her as she had been to Willie Thornton. Remarkable Letters The sum of money the woman Dyer received with each child differs very materially. In one case she was said to have obtained as much as £70, worth nearly £12,000 today. A letter found in her rooms, which is supposed to refer to the above case, is addressed to Mrs. Dyer in a man's handwriting, stating, I shall not expect to hear any more of the child after handing it over to you. The letters are proving an immense advantage to the authorities in tracing witnesses, and it was by this aid that Miss Marnon was found in Cheltenham and Mrs. Sargent in London. More Evidence Mrs. Dyer let part of her house to a Mrs. Chandler, and it now appears that the lady towards the end of last month began to complain to her landlady of a nasty smell which she thought was emanating from Mrs. Dyer's room. For some time the lady protested there was no smell, but Mrs. Chandler asserts that after her first complaint the smell became worse. But suddenly, on the morning of March the 29th, it ceased. It was on the following day, the 30th, that the decomposed body of the child was found in the river. As the river near where Dyer had lived 
were dredged, more bodies were found. From the Southern Echo, the 13th of April, 1896. One of the most shocking crimes in recent annals. The discoveries of the dead bodies of infants at Reading, says the Daily News, points to one of the most shocking crimes in our recent annals. Six bodies in all have been found, mostly within the last few days, either in the Thames, near Reading, or in the little river Kennet at the same place. All the circumstances point to foul play, and the police have reason to believe that the children have been murdered by a baby farmer. They have made two arrests on that suspicion. One of a woman, Mrs. Dyer, said to be the principal, the other of her son-in-law, Mr. Palmer, an alleged confederate. Some of the earlier discoveries showed that there had been a crime. Papers found around the necks of the children, and the bodies were weighted with a brick when thrown into the water. Later on, two more bodies were found in a carpet bag, which was weighted in some way. A piece of paper found with one of the bodies contained an address in Reading. The police went to the house. There they found every indication of a large baby farming business and arrested a woman named Dyer in charge of it. Two of the children had been identified as having been handed over to the baby farmer with a premium of ten pounds. Moreover, the bag in which two of the bodies were found is, according to the evidence taken on Saturday, a bag that was in the possession of Dyer. No more can be said in regard to her except to add that she denies all knowledge of the affair. In its general aspects, the case seems to indicate a system of baby farming and baby murder on a colossal scale, with the riverbed as a lethal chamber. With the continued investigations and backtracking to find the parents, more bodies are found. From the Reading Observer, the 25th of April, 1896, another body discovered. The excitement in the murder was considerably augmented on Thursday when it was made known that another body had been discovered. Dragging elevations had been suspended, but from information the police had received, they were satisfied that other bodies had been deposited in the river, and in consequence the man, Henry Smithwaite and George Bolting, were engaged to resume dragging in the Clapper's Pool. While so doing on Thursday afternoon, about twenty minutes to three o'clock, they came across a suspicious-looking parcel, which on being opened was found to contain the body of an infant. When opened, the top of the skull fell away and the body was seen to be in a very decomposed condition. The body was wrapped in some sacking, and tied with a cord, a brick being also attached to the parcel. The body was removed to the mortuary, where it was examined by Dr. Morris, and two detectives also being present. It was found to be a body of a female, but it was so decomposed as to be beyond recognition. On a red flannel garment, however, they were found the letters J.D., and it is therefore hoped that the mother of the infant will be able to be traced. A piece of tape had been wound tightly round the neck and a knot tied under the ear, and death was undoubtedly due, as in the other cases, to strangulation. Besides the red flannel garment, the child was wearing a diaper and a nightdress at the time it was murdered. We should add that the body was found about a yard from the spot where the carpet bag containing two bodies 
was discovered in the water on the Caversham side of the footbridge. The trial. The trial took place at the Old Bailey on the 21st of May and lasted two days. Annie Dyer was charged with the murder of little Doris Marmon and Barry Simmons. Police had taken extraordinary care in presenting a complete and solid case against Dyer. Evidence of the suspected crimes from the bodies dredged from their rivers and from letters found in Dyer's position were produced to give context to her crimes. Throughout the trial, Dyer insisted that both her daughter and her son-in-law knew absolutely nothing about the crimes. The Doris Marmon case had a solid series of letters between the mother and Dyer under the alias of a Mrs. A. Harding. The mother, a barmaid in Cheltenham, was brought and was able to identify the body of her daughter. She was also able to identify some of the clothing that she had given Dyer for her child, which Dyer had handed over to the daughter. Given the fate of the clearly much-loved little girl, the letters take on a dark and sinister aspect. As the mother attempts many ways for a reassurance that she is indeed doing the right thing for her daughter, and this letter from Dyer helps to show why the mother made the choice of letting go of her child for the possibility of a better life for her daughter. From Dyer, in the guise of A. Harding, Dear Madam, your letter just a hand, and I shall be only too pleased for yourself or any friends to come and see us sometimes. We don't have many visitors out here in the country, and I assure you it would be a great treat for us, as the charge would be to you. I should really feel more comfortable to know the dear little soul had someone that really cared for her. I shall value her all the more rest assured. I promised you I will do a mother's duty by her, and I will bring her up entirely just in the same way as my own daughter. Every care will be taken of her, and when you come, you will soon see I do my duty by her, dear child. Dyer promised in all her correspondence that the mother could come and visit at any time. Some of the other murders laid at her door also referred to in this article. From the Illustrated Police News, the 9th of May, 1896, The Reading Murders, Doris Marmon. In this case, that of the baby Doris Marmon, the mother Edith Marmon, a Cheltenham barmaid, was recalled. She said she handed her child to Mrs. Harding with a ten pounds note and a supply of baby clothes. Since the previous hearing witnesses had seen the woman she knew as A. Harding, she was the prisoner, Mrs. Dyer, whom had appeared at the police court. Clothing produced was the clothing she had handed to the woman with her baby. In this case also, the verdict was one of willful murder against Dyer. Barry Simmons The next inquiry related to the child Barry Simmons, which had been handed to Mrs. Dyer, who is under arrest, charged with the willful murder of this baby. Mrs. Amelia Sargent recalled, added to her testimony at the previous hearing, that she had seen Mrs. Dyer during the past week and recognised her as the woman to whom, as Mrs. Thomas, she gave the baby Henry Simmons. Baby clothes produced in court she recognised as those which she had handed over to Mrs. Dyer with the baby. A verdict of willful murder was returned 
against Mrs. Dyer. "'Tis a small sample of the several deaths that were traceable to Dyer. However, there were far more bodies than letters, and many of the bodies found could not be traced back to their mothers. They were buried in graves as unknown. For her defence, much was made of her time in mental asylums to corroborate her plea of insanity. With such overwhelming evidence against her, and with her own admissions, her argument of insanity did not sway the jury, who took less than five minutes to convict her. From the Edinburgh Evening News, May 1896, The Reading Murders, Sentence of Death. The trial of Annie Dyer for murdering children entrusted to her care was resumed before Mr Justice Hawkins at the Old Bailey, London, yesterday. The Defence For the prisoner said the defence was one of insanity. He proceeded to call evidence to support his contention. Dr Logan, who attended the prisoner in 1894, said he believed the woman was insane due to a disease of the brain. Dr Forbes Winslow, who examined the accused in Holloway Jail, expressed the opinion that she was insane and not feigning insanity. And Dr Scott, medical officer of Holloway Jail, gave it as his belief that the woman was not mad but feigned insanity. A brother of the accused, Mrs Dyer, stated that he had never heard of insanity in the family. The Judge's Remarks Mr Justice Hawkins, after the return of the jury, who were absent only five minutes, said that the jury had convicted the prisoner on overwhelming evidence. The prisoner had been found guilty of base and wicked treachery to the mother of the child she so cruelly murdered for the sake of a few pounds. He was satisfied that she had carried on this wicked trade for a very long time. He could only beg of her to prepare for death in the few remaining days allotted to her. Sentence of death was then passed, and the woman was removed without making a remark. With the sure knowledge of her impending execution, Dyer spent considerable effort trying to clear her daughter and her daughter's husband from guilt. Sentence of death was then passed, and the woman was removed without making a remark. With the sure knowledge of her impending execution, Dyer spent considerable effort trying to clear her daughter and her daughter's husband from guilt. Her two confessions after the trial was over in essence, were a full admittance of having done the crime, but of having done the crime alone and without the knowledge of her daughter or son-in-law. From the Penny Illustrated Paper on the 9th of May, 1896, Mrs. Dyer's confession was the sensation at Reading last Saturday when she was again charged with the infant murders in the Thames. The previous day, the jury found Mrs. Dyer guilty of the murder of a baby belonging to a servant named Goulding and that Mrs. Palmer was an accessory before the fact the younger woman, was at once arrested. On Saturday, there was read in court two letters from Mrs. Dyer to exculpate Palmer, the husband of her smartly dressed daughter, in the dock. In the second letter, Mrs. Dyer wrote, I know I have done this dreadful crime. Mrs. Palmer, her daughter, was brought up in custody and gave evidence which led the magistrate to think that the children whose bodies were found in the carpet bag were murdered in Wilsden. Consequently, they committed Dyer for trial at the Central Criminal Court. No evidence was offered against the man Palmer, 
who was discharged, but immediately apprehended on a charge of deserting a child at Devonport. From the Cardiff Times, the 13th of June, 1896, Behaviour After Conviction. The Press Association's Old Bailey reporter says that Mrs. Dyer's behaviour after conviction was most peculiar. She sat for hours with her eyes riveted first on one of the, her attendants and then on the other, without speaking or betraying any emotion. She manifested such a dislike to one of her attendants that another had to take her place. The convict was not heard to utter one prayer in her cell by her attendants. In a letter she wrote to her daughter, Mrs. Palmer, last week, and she said, I have no soul. My soul was hammered out in Gloucester Asylum. Her thoughts were concentrated not on herself, but on her daughter. The condemned woman received daily close attention from the prison chaplain, who did his best to prepare her for her end. She maintained all along, however, the stolid demeanour shown at her trial. Before the execution scene outside the jail, the Press Association telegraphs Notwithstanding the very large amount of interest in the fate of Annie Dyer, the Reading murderess, it was felt to be scarcely probable that on the morning of her execution the precincts of the Old Bailey would disclose anything like the public commotion which was yesterday recorded. The gallows was not to be cheated of the notorious baby farmer, whose iniquities were so scathingly commented on by the presiding judge, denunciations which were again and again reiterated substantially by the loiterers this morning. For though convicted of the murder of Doris Marmon and Henry Simmons, the two hapless infants entrusted to her fostering care, a view to which the judge was not altogether unsympathetic, that these were two solitary instances in a long career of sordid crime. The motley and bedraggled throng extended from Fleet Lane to Holborn by a quarter to nine o'clock, at which moment the bell of St. Sepulchre began its solemn tolling. A little before this, a warder had appeared upon the parapet for the purpose of affixing the flag to the staff. Amelia Annie Dyer, aged 57 and described in the calendar as a nurse, was executed at Newgate Jail on Wednesday morning at nine o'clock for child murder. Billington was the executioner. Execution accomplished. The black flag was hoisted at nine o'clock, its appearance being hailed with some hooting and a faint attempt at a cheer. For some moments before the fatal ensign was run up to the masthead, a portion of the crowd gathered under one of the adjacent archways and indulged in a series of brutal jests directed at the unhappy culprit about to expiate her crimes. Dire and insanity. Much was made that Dyer had had several stains in insane asylums, keeping in mind that Dyer had been trained as a nurse. At such, it is possible Dyer would have been able to simulate signs of mental instability. The police alleged that her confinements in asylums all corresponded with periods when inquiries were being instituted with regard to children entrusted to her care. Certainly, when she was arrested for the body of the child found in the Thames, she was rocking back and forth as a person with mental illness might do. 
the intricate repeated correspondence that was required in order to sway mothers that she would give a better home to their infant children as well as having the wherewithal to know to go by various aliases and to change her residence regularly would seem to argue against this. This ends the story of Annie Dyer, one of England's most notorious serial killers in history. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, Annie Dyer, the Ogress of Reading. We really hope you enjoyed the show. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload five days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. And Wednesdays will become wicked Wednesdays, and in this series, we will be looking at some of the shocking events, bloody places and outrageous organisations of their day. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.